welcome to everyone. We're, we're, we're thrilled to have so many people here in the room with us, especially those of you from Burlington High School and Edmonds School. Um, so we're, we're taking testimony on S88, which is an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products and e-liquids. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to have members of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and a member of the House uh, Human Services Committee introduce ourselves to you so you know who's here. So I'm Senator Ginny Lyons. I represent Chittenden County, including Burlington, and I chair the Health and Welfare Committee. I'm Debbie Ingram. I'm also from Chittenden County, so I also represent folks in Burlington. I'm Ann Cummings. I represent Washington County right here. So I don't represent it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not from Chittenden County. I'm, I'm Rich Westman, and I'm the senator from Lamoille County. I'm Dick McCormick. I represent the Windsor County Senate District, which is Windsor County plus the towns of Londonderry and uh, Holland, down in the southeastern place. I'm Jessica. Brumstead, and I'm from Shelburne, and I'm in the House, and I'm here because I'm working on this same issue in the House. Good, and it's it's not unusual for House and Senate members to have what are known as companion bills. So we have a bill in the Senate, and there's a companion in the House, and that's the one that Representative Brumstead was referring to. So the Senate will be taking testimony on this bill, and then within the next week or so, we'll be amending the bill as it was brought to us and sending it on its way to the full Senate and then to the House. So, good morning. Um, we have representatives from the Burlington High School. Do you want to come up, bring your chairs up, or do you have a presentation? How do you want to do this? Yeah, we didn't need anything from the, nothing from the presentation. We were just going to show the video to start things off. Big Tobacco's flavor game is not new. Big Tobacco has targeted minority communities with menthol products for decades. Menthol tobacco is easier to start, harder to quit, and just as deadly as non-flavored tobacco. I'm a black Muslim woman. I face enough racism, sexism, and religious prejudices in my life. I see what Big Tobacco is doing and I'm not falling for it. Because of Big Tobacco, my uncle is in a serious battle for his life. I need to speak out. These are our lives, our lungs, and our voices will bring an end to all flavored tobacco. Our friends, our family members, our community. 
we feel a responsibility to educate and inform our peers and community members about the harm of products. We are here to ask you all to take flavored tobacco seriously and protect our peers and our community. I am personally here because flavored tobacco has a huge impact on my life. My friends and family are using flavored tobacco and they started using it because they were unaware they were harming their bodies. My uncle and my father are immigrants and they both use flavored tobacco at a point in their lives. They didn't have the opportunity to get the education and were misinformed about the harm that tobacco has tobacco done. My uncle now has cancer. The next speaker from our group will tell you more about that. And we will hear from other group members who will share about what we see in our school. Our peers are being targeted and not fully thinking about the future impact of the nicotine issue. Thank you. Why don't we, why don't we have, stay here because we'll probably have questions afterwards after you've uh, all testified. So share the microphone. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Hi, I'm close. Thank you. Um, my name is Kamari Brahim. I'm from Lincoln High School. And yeah, so my favorite uncle and my dad started smoking when they came to Vermont. In elementary school, our teachers would tell us how toxic smoking is and how it negatively, negatively affects your body. I remember being really scared about their smoking, and my sisters and I would beg for my dad and uncle to quit. I remember continuously telling my dad and uncle that if they didn't stop, they would die. My fears were justified as last year my uncle was in a battle for his life because of his medical. He ended up getting cancer. It was very hard on all of us because we all really loved him, and his positivity and patience inspired all of us. When we first came to Vermont, my dad stayed back in Texas for more reasons, and so my uncle basically raised my sisters and I. He, was, he has always been there for us, and we are so used to his presence and him being there and supporting us. I don't ever see, my, I don't ever see myself being the same person without him. But my uncle's sickness is at his worst, and when we go to the hospital, nine times out of ten, I will find myself tearing up because it was so hard to see him so sick. His big color changed, he had lost his hair, and he was very, very weak. It hurts me, it hurts me so much to visit him because of that thing not being alive. The next day, he started living hell out of me. And it was even worse because I felt so useless and helpless. Here the man was that raised me and I couldn't even do anything to help him. I am here because speaking out is something I can do to fight feeling helpless. My uncle's illness is something that we can prevent from happening to others. And it makes me so mad and hurt to see ads for tobacco everywhere. The ads try to have try to hide how tobacco can impact you and the people you love most. We have to do everything we can to protect people from the issue. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Shimura, and I'm also a student at Burlington High School. Um, big tobacco companies have, to, have strategically marketed tobacco products to minority groups for decades. The most striking example is in menthol cigarettes. The use of menthol has made it easier to smoke and harder to quit. Menthol cigarettes have long been marketed to black African American communities, and there are more tobacco retails in areas with larger black, multicultural, and low income communities. Big Tobacco has sponsored cost scholarships, cultural events, and have placed advertisements in public places that are popular to these kind of groups. These are all intentional efforts to forge ties with African American communities and build a misleading positive brand, while at the same time 94.9% of African Americans who smoke started using menthol cigarettes. But there are also 10 times more tobacco ads in African American neighborhoods than any other, and those numbers are no mistake. Big Tobacco has fed off of the addiction for decades and has taken the lives of so many in our community, and all for what, money? What about the lives of the youth and adult that these products have taken? And what about the future of our generations? There, there is not enough money in the world where tobacco can give back to these communities to make up for the lives they have taken. As youth under the age of 18, we shouldn't have to be here asking for help to protect our lives and the lives of the people we love. That's the basic privilege we deserve. We should have been protected before this epidemic began. But as 
to show this is something that we really need to do, but we're asking you for your help. Thank you. Questions? I, I have, go ahead. Senator Abel has a question. Hi. Um, are, there, um, are there like specific ad campaigns that uh, you feel are directed towards like people your age or directed towards immigrants or, um, uh, or, or is it, do you feel like it's just you know the flavor? Um, um, I think that the biggest thing we see is that many of the ads observe a huge thing that would happen. Many of the ads, as you can see here, they have bright colors or they have like things that kids would want to eat. And a lot of them uh, feature African American couples or like people having fun. And I think that adults, youth are more likely to look at these kind of pictures and think, wow, that must be cool. So, I'm sure about menthol cigarettes, are any of your friends vaping? Yeah. Would you say more of your friends are vaping now than cigarettes themselves, or? Definitely, I think they're definitely vaping more than cigarettes. Yes, because, and I think that's mostly us being in the as much stigma on vapes than there are any actual cigarettes. And I mean, there are a lot of advertisements around vaping that you see here, or is it mostly peer pressure that's, that's pushing me towards vaping? I think it's okay, and also, a lot of them are Do you mind using the mic? I'm sorry to do this to you. Can you get Besides that, we're just learning 
English and math and science. Yeah, right. No, that's, that's, I appreciate hearing that. I'm, I'm really curious, are there, if there are, we change the age of um, how old you had to be to buy these cigarettes, which is 21 now, and I'm curious if you're finding that some of your friends in school are trying to not use e-cigarettes anymore, but are finding it difficult, and are they getting much help? Um, I don't think they are. I do think that the uh, babies would get kind of help some people, but I know people are still getting it from stores and online. So I don't think people are like, oh, like, well, they changed the age of prescription, so I'm just going to quit later and still finding ways to access it. Thank you. Do you have a I feel like it's the kind of constricting the age of girls kind of thing. We should just get rid of it, period, because can you move closer? Oh, um, yeah. Um, I think that's quite a point. <laughs> Thank you. I think that, like, how we just, like, restricting that and that kind of thing will not do nothing because at the end of the day, those people, people who are addicted, the young people that are addicted to nicotine, they're going to find a way to get, whether it's asking somebody's fire for them, it's older than them, whatever the case may be, they're still going to find a way to get it. You know, and, like, there's even, like, little shops they have where somebody older will get it, and they're, like, kind of shipping it between the community, and they're, like, selling that kind of stuff. And so I feel like just getting rid of it completely is going to be, it's, like, the solution to the problem, because restricting and adding restrictions and that kind of stuff isn't going in. So did, did you say that most of the ads in uh, in that are out there are about cigarettes and not vaping. No. I don't think the like they weren't about like, cigarettes. And then um we come on to the project with it was called the Forty Bush Project and the Manhattan community and there was multiple ads of like e-cigarettes and jewels and there were places like right like posters and like on the D lights and like the town. So it's like that has left that passion to those advertisements. Senator McCormick, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thanks for your, your testimony. It was confident, uh, persuasive. And I lost a parent to cancer, so I'm sympathetic. You know, it's a nightmare. What is the cultural attitude among your peers at school about smoking and about vaping? And what I'm thinking about is this. When I was a kid coming up in the 50s and 60s, believe it or not, there were people around me. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a man on my block who did not smoke. He did not smoke, and we thought he was weird. Every one of my friends, fathers and mothers, smoked. It was the norm. And to suggest that maybe you shouldn't was considered weird. So there has been a move away from the tobacco culture already. And it took years. I remember the first time I saw on someone's desk just a sign, thank you for not smoking. I thought what an, an annoying person it was to dare have that sign there. We used to smoke in movie theaters, we used to smoke on airplanes. And gradually we moved away. What is the attitude among young people in school, your friends, your people you go to the classroom? Do they disapprove, or is it largely seen that this is what is done, and the non-smokers, the non-vapors, are sort of weird? Yeah. 
much. But nobody's ever, like, you know, come up to me when I show up here, because that would be a problem. <laughs> So one of the one of the um, issues that we have to address in this bill, uh, we're, we're obviously looking at flavored vape products, but also methyl uh, tobacco and flavored tobacco products. And I'm wondering, you come out pretty strong against ending uh, methyl and other flavored tobacco products. Is that a is that a is that a position? What did, how did you come to that? Is that because you see kids around you using those products, or is it a result of your uncle's experience? What what leads you guys to, or is it simply the information that's that's out there from um, uh, scientific information that's out there? Um, that was a hard question to answer. I think that for different, I, yeah, I feel like different people would answer this question differently. But for me, I also grew up around people who smoked. Like that was like the norm. And I feel like the only reason why I'm like, why I wouldn't do it is because like, I chose to find ways to be educated. I didn't, like nobody said, oh, do you want to learn about this? It was kind of something that I found on my own. I didn't like it. Okay. Um, okay. I do, and I feel like for me, it was all of those. I was concerned about my community, my friends, and then like when well, my uncle lost cancer, that's when it, I guess like hit me like this is affecting people's lives. This is, and that's what it's like. Yeah. I just look back and it's that. Yeah, I was the same thing with her. That was so weak. Uh, I think my own experience and like how it like, affected my life, even though it wasn't me going through, it was going through. I think that's what it kind of hit me, but I've also been doing a few months before that. So I think it's also like realizing how it impacts me as like a black um, Muslim female. And yeah, just realizing that I feel really targeted and I don't like them that way. And so yeah. Yes, one more, and then we'll go ahead. So, you have a comment. We don't want to interrupt your comment. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to like share something. So I feel like for me, even though I've been like learning about this stuff, it took me a few years for it to like actually hit me. Like literally this year, after I watched a certain video, it, I was really kind of disgusted because. Like, when you think about it, it just, it, for me, it feels like there were people, years ago, there were people, they sat around a table and they thought about how they could get youth and other people to use their products, knowing well that it would hurt their bodies. So, and I, and I still don't understand it because for money, that's not worth it. One last question, Senator West. So my sense, the, the, the feeling I get from this, to tell me if it's right, most of the people that are older in your family smoke, most of your friends now are dying. So this is the vaping piece, it's kind of generational. It's, do any of the people, do people of your um, parents and your uncle's age, do they all smoke? Or do they be too? No. Well, for me, after um, it happened to my uncle, everybody had one stop. But, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I only have two. Um, actually, my uncle smoked also. And he actually died because he got lung cancer. And my. And then I only have two other family members, but not all of them. I have a big family, so. We want to keep a big family. Let's <laughs> yes. get that. Um, I do agree with, like, tomorrow, like, my first time, like, after this, I 
start smoking cigarettes, like, um, he got his, like, gum patches, and then he moved on to, like, tobacco products, and then after the thing with my uncle, like, it was disgusting, so, like, we all just try to stay away from that. We can't thank you enough for being here today and all of your friends who have brought moral and other support. This is terrific. And, uh, you know, I think as, as this bill moves forward, that maybe my House colleagues, including Representative Bromstead, may be inviting you back down here to uh, help them understand the bill a little bit more. Yes, ma'am. We just had it. They actually are pretty yeah. to pull onto our site. Oh, well, well, we'd love to hear it.
I, I must admit a lot of the things that I'm going to say today have already been said by not only the um, kids here today, but by my colleagues from the um, health voluntaries. Mine might be just a little bit more in depth. Please feel free to interrupt me as we go through this. I also teach a class on health disparities at Toronto University as a graduate medical college in California. This is also my last year doing that. They called me back in Louisville. My place broke the slip, and um, they called me back in. So I'm leaving here on Thursday. I think class on Friday. Um, the, these slides I'm about to show you, many of you know, and unfortunately, the, the good thing about this slide it shows that lung cancer incidence rates um, are going down for the top red line, which were for African Americans. Of course, the bad thing about this is um, there's still a gap. What we call it, called disparity gap. Thank you. 
in certain stores. They aren't allowed to have jobs. There's no voting rights that. But the tobacco industry is ahead of the curve. They're hiring people, putting them on television, and promoting them. Um, this is this is being eaten up by African Americans. Um, I think someone mentioned yesterday in the hearing. Um, some of these are old pictures. I'm going to show you 50 years of pictures.
Massachusetts. Um, storefront cigarette advertising differs by racial and ethnic community. Many of you are familiar with Boston and different communities. Dorchester used to be and probably still is predominantly African American. Paul Brookline is definitely much more upscale. The ad speaks for itself.
so, but so if we don't know why and the research doesn't point to have adequate information for us yet, then uh, we shouldn't make assumptions. We shouldn't make assumptions, but we also need to do some more research. Yes. We also need to look into this to find out. We know about a lot of this other stuff because of the predatory market. But I didn't, I didn't use my tagline in, I didn't use my tagline in this, but I think part of what that happens is 
today 
somewhat um, restriction of flavors, but it's not really a restriction of flavors. Um, you can still, if you're using these cigarettes, you're using open system, you can still buy flavors that way. It's only the jewels that have a closed system that are being restricted. But of course, both in terms of the closed systems and in terms of the um, um, the flavors, menthol is of course exempt. Again, this is 2020. This is started on the 1st of January. Um, this is an 11-year period I've just gone through with you that um, we're confronting. And why we're even here today is because the federal government, look at it from our point of view, from the activist point of view. After working with the FDA for years, we said later for that, we're going to do this at the local level. I won't go back through all of the, the local, well, I'll, come, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I have to mention this. Um, there are many forces arrayed against the black slave. Um, whether it's poverty, polit politics, and of course the tobacco industry, but it's important that we keep in mind, unfortunately, that black leadership organizations take money from the tobacco industry and actually promote the tobacco industry line. I'm only going to talk about this a little bit, but let's be clear that American uh, Reynolds American Incorporated, or R.J. Reynolds, sponsored a nationwide tour a couple of years ago of Al Sharpton, Kendrick Meeks, John Dixon, Neil Franklin, um, and others um, to actually promote menthol cigarettes. Of course, Al Sharpton is the one who's come out with the idea that if you if you take if you get rid of menthol cigarettes, it's going to lead to the criminalization of African Americans. Let me encourage, let me say to you as strongly as I can that there have been 221 flavor regu regulations passed around the country. There have been no arrests of anybody for possession. There have been 36 cities that have taken up menthol restrictions. There has been not one arrest of these people. It's just not true. Another thing that is being told is that, quote, unquote, this is a black cigarette. Um, the only reason it's a black cigarette is because, as I showed you, it was pushed down our throat over a 50-year period. Um, and people say, well, why don't you take, get rid of other people's cigarettes? Well, we're, frankly, I'm trying to save people's lives. And the black folks are dying disproportionately of this. This is why we're trying to get rid of them. We would, this is a whole presentation in and of itself, and I'm going to move on to it right now. The good news is um, the Delta Sigma Theta um, sorority and NAACP has broken with that and actually passed national resolutions um, in terms of calling for local and state chapters to join in working with this. To, to, to wit, we um, um, work with NAACP throughout the country on this today. I'm going to give my, give my colleagues a little play. Dr. Valerie Yerger, who works with Delta Sigma Theta, was responsible for that um, national resolution. And my colleague, my co-chair, Carol Magruder, the, um, for the AATCLC, was responsible for the 2016 NAACP passing I, I've actually received a letter from our NAACP. Good. Yeah. OK. Yeah. No, it's, so it's not all a bad thing. It's, right. But it's work. we still have work to do. Unfortunately, we're all aware of the jewel bone rush that is going on. Um, they are focusing on black and Latino lawmakers. They've got over 400 lobbyists. When I did this slide about four or five months ago, they were in 49 states. They are now in 50 states. Of course, they're passing one. They think Tobacco 21 will take care of everything. I think as some of the kids have pointed out, you can pass all the laws you want. If kids want to, that's how I got cigarettes. That's how you get alcohol. You know, when you're a kid, you get somebody to get it for you. It's, I mean, re yeah, some retailers are making bad decisions, but that's for me, not how kids do things. Of course, kids know that. Uh, be aware that Ben Jealous is running for, um, possibly running for mayor of Baltimore, has been hired by Jewel. Um, to lead their youth um, engagement um, section. It's outrageous. They've given a $7.5 million grant to McHarry, um, a historically black uh, college and university. I actually spoke there in August about this. Um, they already, yeah, this is an old slide. There's a support of FDA's push to menthol in e-juices. They're leading it in e-juices. 
and then the campaign in San Francisco, I'll talk about it a little bit more. What you're going to see, I don't know if it, you know, things have kind of um, really stalled for Jewel, but they were thinking of having Jewel stores, where, you know, like you go into an, I, an iPhone store, and you'd be all slick and pretty. You could do that, too. I'm, I'm coming toward the end here, folks. The fight to ban menthol. Um, let me just say the first city that we did this work in was Chicago. They put up a 500-foot barrier around schools um, to prevent the sale of these products. The next group of cities had, were in Minnesota, in, um, in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth, where they restricted sales to tobacco-only um, establishments. But today we have 36 cities um, that have menthol restrictions. Why well, have an asterisk by it? They're increasing as we speak. Last week, um, the city of Carson in um, Southern California passed menthol restrictions. And similarly, the, there are 221 locales around the country that have flavor restrictions, and that's during every day, too. There are five states why there's the, um, that have you know, the emergency e-cigarette um, flavor restrictions. Asterix by Massachusetts that we are able to work there this fall, and what we're encouraging Vermont to do is follow that lead and outlaw all flavors across the state, straight up. Um, tobacco industry referendum was soundly defeated in 2018. I won't go into all the details of that, but they put forward a proposal that would have made the selling of menthol just as legal as it, as it used to be. In 2009, the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco passed e-cigarette restrictions until the FDA got FDA, until FDA, until FDA, until FDA, they got FDA approval. There's a great slide. <laughs> we, we, we all make mistakes, okay. Um, of course, the empire struck back. They put a ballot on the measure. They put a ballot on the measure on the, on the, on, on for voters, what we call Prop C, it would overturn the cigarette moratorium and it would overturn the flavor restrictions. They lost. So this is the take home message. Methyl is a social justice issue. The disproportionate marketing and targeting of candy flavored poison to African Americans and other specially oppressed sectors of our society is outright discriminatory and genocidal. The poorest, the folks that are least informed, the folks with the fewest resources, indeed the definition of preying on the most vulnerable section of society is what's taking place here. If menthol were banned, this is a great study that was done um, a few years back. If menthol were banned, and only 30% of the people who were smoking cigarettes stop smoking, of only 30%. You know, the other 60%, I'm sure there's a lot going on. And the chart goes from 10 to 9. I'm just showing you this. Half a million lives would be saved. A quarter million of them would be African Americans. What's at stake for Vermont and everybody else? It's our children and our future. This is a great, great picture. Here's a gentleman sitting on his skateboard, hat backwards, surrounded by tobacco imagery. This is what we're fighting against, and this is why I'm here today. With that, I'll stop. I want to thank you. This is how I can be contacted, at least on the top one, for the, for the next week. <laughs> I need to change that. Um, but I'll take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. That's uh, comprehensive, and I know that each slide, as you said, probably goes to another hour long. We're very appreciative of the, the, of the, the thought that you brought to us. Senator McCormick. Is there any research that one of the motives for the tobacco industry to target people of color is that like, for the last century, uh, people of color have sort of defined what's cool. Young white people imitate the black, you know, the young white guys pick up on a style of something that was fashionable in the black community two or three years earlier. And then later on, the young white guys start turning their baseball caps backwards or whatever. But even Dale, back in the 50s, the rock and roll, it's black, young white people kind of want to be white. So, so we have tobacco documents that back 
actually say exactly what you just said. Af young African-American men are trendsetters. Those are the terms used by the tobacco industry. And if we can get the trendsetters to use our product, that will, that will help other people use their product. Um, I, should, I, I should send you those, those things. Uh, they actually say that. So you're very, that's exactly right. Having said that, let's take it another step. In the 50s, uh, this not only went on with rock and roll, but look at it this way. African Americans are moving from the south to the north uh, in great numbers that are in segregated situations. And there began a movement um, within the um, within business in the United States to develop products specifically for this population. Um, different hair oils, different food products, and they went, aha, we can have different smokes for different folks. Okay, and then that became the impetus from 1945 up until that slide I showed you in 1958 of trying to figure out how to how do you use a segregated black market? The tobacco industry figured out. The next step, then they figured out, oh, African American um, young men are trendsetters. Let's use that too. You put those two together, I think it answers your question. Questions? So I'm, I'm going to ask the question again. I know I think we asked it yesterday, and I think you answered it, but very briefly, because I know you need to get to a press conference. Um, the, as do some other folks in the room. Um, if flavors were banned for uh, vaping, e cigs, uh, what, and menthol was still left in cigarettes, what would we see happen? Do, uh, Unfortunately, we think that people would gravitate toward menthol cigarettes. Unfortunately, what we're seeing around the United States are people are taking up. Um, I appreciate the questions earlier about these cigarettes. Um, I've traveled around the country, and this is what I do for a living. People are trying to separate these two issues out. Oh, let's deal with the flavor issue in the e-cigarettes, and it's hurting these young people, but let's leave menthol in um, while it's killing all these other people. I think that's discriminatory and it shouldn't be done. With that. So, I have one other thing that, that your answer to that sparked another question for me. What, how about the menthol smokers who have been smoking, as you showed us, for a very long time? Do you think that if we ban menthol cigarettes, they will gravitate towards regular cigarettes? I have data, and, and, and your observation is right. There's so much to tell on this. There's been interviews of menthol. The, the, the study has been done on that. A good 60% said they would stop smoking cigarettes. Okay, we actually have data on that. I used to be a menthol cigarette smoker. There was no way I was going to smoke. Ugh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it, it, unless it had something to flavor it, I wasn't going to do that. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that's we we know that. And one thing I, I need to add, if legislation is passed, it's important that there be cessation services for menthol smokers and other smokers as part of that. We can't take this big product away from somebody and then not give them help in dealing with it. So let me that's a good place to end this. So, so that is a good place and, and we'll actually be taking some testimony about cessation services being uh, covered without copay from our private carriers. So across the so that's something important and thank you for bringing that up. But thank you for having me. Terrific. Thank you.